I always tell the team, like, everything in business is a sinusoidal wave. And what you can't see is that sinusoidal wave is doing this. It's going up, right? But all you feel is these ups and downs. And so when we're at down, the only thing you know for absolute certain is that things are going to go up. Hmm. And so, like, hold on to that. Same thing. When you're in an up, the only thing you know is that it's going to suck soon. It's going to suck so bad soon. And so, like, get off your high horse. There's not the time to celebrate. Like, it's time to, like, batten down the hatches a little bit and, like, ride this wave while I say Like, enjoy it. But don't, don't take pride in it. Hello, I'm Ty Morse. Welcome to Relentless. This is my conversation with Garrett Scott, the founder of Pipe Dream Labs. I hope you enjoy the conversation. So what was the most, you grew up in Oklahoma, right? Yeah, okay. uh, I grew up in Dallas, okay. um, went to school in Oklahoma. Okay, what was the most interesting thing about growing up in Dallas? I don't know, I think it was, it was interesting for me because you know I go to places like LA and San Francisco and New York and I'm like, oh, I get why people think it's so hard to put infrastructure in. Cause like you're in those cities that are like these great cities and all the infrastructure is super old. And so you know, in your head you're like, okay, ergo. Uh, it's super tough to put infrastructure in. Um, but growing up in Dallas, like infrastructure would go in all the time. Like we were always upgrading stuff. We were the first to have fiber. We were, um, you know, I just think, think growing up somewhere where you could see how easy it was to do things, gave you a lot of confidence that, okay, this isn't like a technological issue. It's not um, because we don't have the capabilities. It's like people problem. If you get past the people problem, you can do whatever you want. So uh, I think that was huge. I, I never thought about it. Um, but I think outside of that, Dallas is, uh, it's a bubble. It's like one of those cities that's so frustrating that it's not a startup city. And I had no exposure to startups whatsoever in Dallas it, up until college. I didn't know what a startup was. Um, and I just happened uh, to find out and then got, got lost in the sauce uh, and just fell in love with it. It was great. Um, but Dallas is the corporate through and through to this day. Uh, very few startups come out of Dallas. It's so frustrating. There's so much money and infrastructure there. It's so cheap to live. It's a great place to raise a family. It's such a great place to raise a family. Um, but it is so frustrating that it's not a startup city. Is it just like the uh, the people there aren't looking to take those kinds of bets? Or what do you think? That's my theory, is that it doesn't promote risk-taking. Mm -hmm. um, the people who have been there are people who um, or like a different kind of risk. Um, and people are there to raise a family. Uh, and to raise a family, you kind of want a stable job. So uh, I think it attracted just a lot of people who are corporate there's great jobs there, great jobs. Um, but it does, yeah, it's, it's not the, it doesn't attract the kind of people who are gonna take a big risk. There's no incentive to. Okay. Uh, what was the, you said in another interview that you were kind of like always on the, you always wanted to make and sell things. Oh, you didn't yeah. actually have the word for like business and that's what you should be in. Uh, what was the first thing that you tried to make and sell? Oh, I, I, I knew exactly what it is. Um, oh, this is so funny, because uh, it's kind of what I'm doing now. I never thought about it. Uh, so the first thing I tried to make and sell was this was back when everyone had Garmin's in their car uh -huh. um, and some like really, really, really low cellular connectivity, um, but not quite apps on your cell phone yet. So it's like that weird middle ground. And I hated waiting in line at a drive-thru or like I just hated things not being quick. And so I emailed a bunch of people um, I had my dad uh, email for me, but uh, I, I looked up all these email addresses and I pitched like people like Starbucks, and McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. I was like, you should have a way to know when someone is getting close to the restaurant so that they can order ahead and not start making it until you get close enough um, that like all those things lined up. Cause you knew where people were. Um, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it was something like that. And I just had like this, my grand vision was to, as like any person who doesn't know business, is like, let them have the idea. Uh, but I wanted uh, Some Starbucks for life. <laughs> yeah, I, wanted, I just wanted, like, if I had a car that could get me Starbucks for life, it'd be the coolest guy <laughs> when, when, How old were you at this? <laughs> oh, I was like middle school. I was like middle 10 school. or 11. I think I had some other ideas. Um, I made a website for, uh, it's super weird. I don't know, it was like for Christian athletes. is like tracking professional Christian athletes, but just the Christian ones, which was kind of, I was like, with a twist seven or eight yeah I don't, I don't know who that was for um oh i had a uh yeah really 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 young when i was in third grade super embarrassing um i had there's a bunch of annoying people this is so weird 
people would pay me to annoy other people. <laughs> but like I was farming it out. They were like annoying people. So we had these, um, God, this is so weird. I don't even know what I'm talking about. This. Uh, we had these like sayings we would do, like mm -hmm. we would call them lectures. Mm -hmm. And you'd, you'd pay someone to go around and like lecture to people to annoy them. We get, we get paid for it. And so one of them was, I can't remember what they were, but they were like these like, uh, and you just repeat them. You repeat them, repeat them, repeat them. I think a lot of them had good, good lessons behind them, good mm -hmm. morals. Um, but uh, yeah, we would sell, and I ended up selling the business on the last day of school. Um, for, How did that work? Uh, someone offered it to me. It had good cash flow. Um, I was kind of against it because it was, uh, I don't know, the, the moral gray area. Uh -huh. um, but someone gave me 60 bucks. They gave me 320s. I thought I felt like I was on top of the world. Um, and I, I transferred ownership of the lectures to them, the, the IP. Um, and then their goal was to like scale it up over the summer uh, for fourth grade. But I think by the time we got to fourth grade, we had all like matured a little bit. And, you know, I think there's just a market for that third grade and below, but there's not anything past it. Huh. Um, I've never, yeah, I've never heard of someone coming up with that business, and, and was this like, you said uh, third grade, third grade? Yeah, it's kind of like the last year a business like that can work. So what what grade did you actually transfer the IP ownership? At the end of the third grade. At the end of third yeah. grade on graduation. I think there okay. were like six different lectures. It's so weird. It was the worst. It had to have been why my parents decided to homeschool me a couple of years later. Um, but yeah, I, I I made it really clear I was not going to annoy someone. But mm -hmm. I think the market existed so that those were, annoying people were there. And there were people who wanted to, like, it, it, was, it was an efficient market. There was an opportunity. There was an opportunity. It was and an arbitrage opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it was the last time I, uh, I played in the world of arbitrage. But uh, yeah. Yeah. I, so I want to know, because you said that you didn't really like discover business building until college. Um, who did you look up to when you were younger before you went to college? Great question. I mean, I love Nikola Tesla. I thought he was the coolest. Um, just like trying to do something that seemed impossible at the time and then pulling it off was like, that's the magic trick. That is the coolest thing you can do with your life is to take something on the tech tree that people didn't think would ever be possible and, and make it happen. Um, and I think it was a lot of, uh, I, had I had family members that were more marketers and I think my parents definitely looked on them and we're like, well, that's like lying. You can't, you can't be a marketer. That's, you know, it's adjacent to lying. Like, do good work, pull off something good, and then it'll be so good that people will talk about it. Wait, so did your parents impress that idea on you that marketing is bad? Yeah. Okay, oh, so you super. Because you later have this like transition where you're like, actually, things don't just sell themselves. I do actually need to go do that legwork in marketing to yeah. make it happen. Uh, and so that's where it kind of came from that uh, Totally. Idea. I, I mm. still can't like completely take that cycle out of my brain. I think a lot of the time still, like there's just like that voice in the back of my head that's like, just do good work, don't talk about it. You know, like it will be so good other people will talk about it. And if you're talking about it, it's cause you're like, either you have a huge ego um, or the thing isn't good enough and so you have to lie about it. Mm -hmm. And like, they're, they're, I, I feel like a lot of great engineers get stuck there too. I, I, I think like, um, there's even some like really prolific engineers um, who just have such a disdain for sales and marketing because uh, yeah. they don't understand what it is. And I didn't understand what it was. Um, you know, I think a lot of people see it as like bridging the gap between like a product and its usefulness. And so if you have to do marketing, it's because your product didn't achieve usefulness. And if you achieve usefulness, there's no need enough. for marketing, right? It's like bridging that gap. Um, and I think it took me a long time to realize that like markets are just really inefficient and like something existing doesn't mean someone's going to use it. Right. If there's like a hammer on the wall and someone's like trying to push in a nail, right? Like in an engineer's head, they're going to look around. Okay. Okay. What tool available is there to hit this nail? I'm going to like experiment and find one. Oh, this hammer rocks. Okay. Good hammer. I'm going to go tell everyone else, Hey, hammer works with nail. And then so you like, you know, your job is to just put a hammer on the wall and just sit back and wait. Cause like, people solve the problem with your tool that you use to solve it. And I think like what I came to realize is like, no, you got to draw people's attention to it, right? Like people are not going to seek to solve those problems until you kind of like, ex you know, I, I think the, the idea to see the world as a set of problems is not innate. And an engineer is unique in that they see it, but they, they don't know that others don't. So they're living in a totally different world than other people. And so I think you do have to put signage. You gotta be like, okay, this hammer works for nails. 
Like go, go in like, you know, or use even this. go talk with people. Go and talk tell with them. them like, Hey, I see works. you've got a, you're hitting that nail with your fist. <laughs> Let me show you how this works. <laughs> this thing rocks. Uh, and, um, yeah. So I think there's just like a, a misalignment there and, and engineers not really realizing that people's brains work differently. Yeah. Um, can, can I ask what, why did your parents impress the idea on you that marketing wasn't a good thing or was kind of shammy or yeah. sleazy? Well, I, I think it came from a really good place. Um, I mean, my parents, uh, I come from a Christian background and my parents are like, the best. They're so good. Um, just great people. I've lived such an amazing life. Um, I just couldn't have asked for a better childhood. Uh, but like one of their core tenants, my mom especially, is like, you want to live beyond reproach. Hmm. And the links that she goes to make sure that she is like always honest, always transparent, always trustworthy. Um, you know, she always said like, you know, lifetime to build a reputation and like five minutes, to ruin, it. Five minutes yeah. to ruin it. Yeah. Um, but I think like the sales and marketing thing kind of got like tucked into that, which is like a good thing. But like anything that wasn't doing the work was bad. The only good thing in life is doing the work. And like that lesson has helped me so much. It's just like the sales and marketing should have made it in, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, the, <laughs> there's some the nuance to, 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 to part of the work. If you, if yeah, you do exactly. it correctly, if you're building something that really is helpful yeah. for people, you have yeah. to tell them about it. You, that's totally. part of the job. It's totally. Maybe one of the most important jobs. But right. I mean, I'm like, I'm glad that I learned that lesson and then the sales and market lesson second instead of the other way around. Cause like just doing the work is so ingrained to me and like, I can't, I want to trade anything for that. Mm -hmm. That means the world to me. Um, so I really appreciate him for that. Uh, but yeah, what's crazy is my mom has to be the best marketer I know. Really? Uh, oh yeah. Anytime I, I have like, Hey, I'm trying to like think of like a slogan mm -hmm. or a name for this or like a way to help people realize how to use this. She's so good at finding it. Uh, but then she's like, don't use that. <laughs> I'm like, right, I won't, I won't, I won't use that. Um, but no, she, she rocks. She's great. Yeah. Um, what, did you create any other things when you were in like high school? What was the transition between going from, I guess, early years to like going into homeschooling? What was the thought process behind that? Why they put, went yeah, why to they homeschooling? Um, I think like in Dallas, it, it's largely, it's two things. Like I think one, it's, um, I think people people actually think there's a religious element. I, I don't think it's as much religious. It, it might be for other people. Um, for me, I think uh, this is not. Yeah, not not to not to be no flex or like, but like I was always like pushing the limit of school mm -hmm. um, in public school. Like often pretty bored. Um, so I was in the gift and talent program, which they have in Texas, uh, and then that also was just like pretty slow. Pretty slow. Um, so my mom thought, well, let's, you know, let him run, uh, let him go out on his own. And my mom's super smart. So there's a lot she could teach us. And also like the ecosystem in Dallas for homeschooling is super developed. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really interesting. I think like another thing that people on the coast don't realize how developed homeschooling is, um, that's really more about like assembling Lego pieces mm -hmm. more than it is about like being at home schooling. Uh, so, you know, I went to co-ops and I went to classes, places and other people's moms uh, taught me, but it's just like all of it was more self-paced and you could put together kind of the menu of options. Um, so I'd gone through like calc through, you know, by high school, um, kind of go at my own pace. Uh, and like, you know, I, I think like in becoming a self-starter, that was huge. Um, since my whole school was self-starting. If I didn't self-start, I wasn't going anywhere. Uh, so yeah, I think it was, it was a great call on their part. And also like the, on the social, same point, I think people have this idea of like denim skirt and uh, you know, you're out on the farm and isolated, which is also true sometimes. Uh, but like in Dallas, like the, the socials of, I mean, I, I played on a basketball team, we played public schools, I ran track, um, I went to parties, like all, the, all the, the social aspect of homeschooling's there in Dallas, so um, it was great. Did you create anything while you were in the homeschooling years? I feel like I did, but I, I can't remember. Not anything good, I guess. <laughs> okay. Um, so before you like discovered entrepreneurship, you decided to go to mechanical engineering school mm -hmm. um, yeah. because you wanted to make things, but and you thought that that was like the career path uh, that did that. Uh, what was that thought process? Oh yeah, I just wanted to be the best at making things. You just um, wanted to be the best at making yeah, things. I just like like a lot of the stuff that I was making before college. Um, it was all mechanical things. I love mm -hmm. stuff in the real world. Um, 
and like it just you have such more of a lasting impact when you create like you know a hammer or a screwdriver or like a stop sign or a like tool for others yeah, yeah yeah totally um and i also just didn't have enough exposure to uh software and scalability mm -hmm. um but it's like i i really what i saw mechanical engineering as is like i talked to a lot of engineers I was like, what's the, what's the most all-encompassing one? What's the one that if you do this, you can do the rest? And they all said mechanical. Like, it's the problem-solving one, um, which I think is largely true. Uh, but, yeah, going through college, realize, like, oh, gosh, it, there's uh, not much here that is going to help me. <laughs> um, and there's not really a career path in mechanical engineering. I saw my professors, like, okay, here's what I want to do. What should I do to start down that path, right? I want to I invent things. And they're like, ooh, get a job and learn it's like yeah but like n no one's really learning in mechanical engineering at a job right you're either like a pm or you're a cad monkey or you're one of the two like you're not uh there's not many strategy jobs in mechanical engineering um not much design engineering um it's really really hard to get into um so it's pretty clear that yeah that wasn't what wasn't was the about. what was the like transition from like going into college, getting disillusioned, and then deciding, I think you read like the uh, Paul Graham essays. And oh, I think yeah. you decide, you just described it as like a religious uh, conversion or something when you read <laughs> yeah. that, what was that like? Yeah, it was that and This Week in Startups really? uh, rocked. Yeah, This Week in Startups is so good. I don't think people realized outside of the coasts, the impact This Week in Startups from Jason Calacanis has uh, in the flyover states. Um, he is like a deity. Uh, to be like, go, go ask anyone who like, you know, grew up, uh, who is an entrepreneur now and like went to school or grew up in middle America, uh, like his impact is massive. Um, it was just like, he interviews people and you know, they, they lay out, okay, this is how I started the thing. And you realize like, oh my gosh, there's like no magic to it. It's just like find a problem and then just like lose yourself to the work, which is such like a middle America, uh, type rallying cry. Um, that's like you, like anyone can just get their hands dirty and make it happen. Um, and everyone else pitches businesses like this thing that like, Hey, you gotta go get your MBA. Cause it's still like, uh, running through getting your, your college accolades is, is so huge in like middle America where it's like more religious and, and people really imprint that on you. Um, and in like Im immigrant culture as well, uh, that someone's saying like, just get your hands dirty and just do it. And then meeting people who also did that was so liberating and like really distilled it down to like, oh, this is so simple. This is like the simplest way to solve a problem. And there's an ecosystem built to allow you to do that. Uh, and it was, it was like a religious experience. It's like, oh my gosh, like this is it. This is the thing. Uh, I, I just want to do this for the rest of my life. It's what perfect. Was the, what was the first thing that you, you know, you, I, you said that you discovered this, well, like two years into college. I'm pretty mm -hmm. sure that you actually graduated, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. I ended up graduating. So what did you do in between like discovering this and then graduating? outside of classes great question I, I tried a lot of stuff um what were some of those things oh gosh we had there's one that i wish i had done uh that i i let people talk me out of it oh really um That's yeah why. it was called horrible name it had a horrible name but uh it was called wolf mm -hmm. uh and a w u l f no <laughs> idea why i don't I, I i think i hadn't learned how long you have to look for domain names to find like a really good one so i was just like that one exists and it was like one syllable and I loved it. Um, I think it was a project name. I don't think I was going to keep it all the way through, but uh, it was grocery delivery, hmm. but on a next morning uh, time scale. So, so like the idea 18 hour thing. Yeah. Yeah. It was just, but there was always delivering at the same time. Hmm. So the idea was, and this was before this is before I had heard of Instacart. I think Instacart existed in, in some, I think they started in 2012 and I think halfway through would be 2014, right? Yeah, yeah, it was about 2014. Um, so I don't think it hit <laughs> Oklahoma yet. Um, but the idea was um, you could drive down a lot of that cost by aggregating all the shopping at one time. Mm -hmm. So first thing in the morning, all the orders had already gone through. So you could pull everything together into one basket and then go do one milk run, delivering everything, um, drive down the cost of those individual orders. Um, I thought there was also like, we'd run the numbers. There was some good coupon arbitraging you could do there. Um, what did that look like? I've never oh, cause you're just coupon. getting so much stuff that uh -huh. if you had a good handle on what coupons were available, you could just use them okay. and then keep that and, or pass the savings on to the customer, mm -hmm. whatever, whatever was better. Um, and the idea was like charge flat month three rate, which I don't think would have ended up working, but you could get the cost of that overall delivery way down. Um, and so I went and like 
print out a bunch of flyers and I'd knock on people's doors and like hand them a flyer and be like, here's this. Like, what, what do you think? <laughs> do you want to sign up? <laughs> uh, and I did that for like two days of just walking neighborhoods, just handing out flyers, knocking on doors, handing out flyers, yeah. knocking on doors, like this thing, what do you think? And people were like, I don't think it exists. It's like fair. But like, if it did, <laughs> like, would you use it? And people were like, I don't know if I want my groceries delivered. It's like, okay, why not? And it was like really like trying to understand like what it was. Um, and I think like really what, what did the nail in is like I had a good set of like 10 people wanted to try it. But one person just would not let up on the terms and conditions. Hmm. She had gone through that terms and conditions and she was like hitting up point by point. I don't know if she had a lawyer working with her or what, but she was going to town on like just the terms and conditions sheet. And I was like, oh my gosh, if this is what it is to set up every person, like I got to rethink this whole thing. Um, but we had got like a basic website working and... Uh, a lot of people told me like grocery delivery, like people like going to the grocery store is not yep. going to work. And I was like, you know, I was like, okay, I guess not. Um, but I wish I had, you know, OJ kept going, but what were um, the, what were the other projects that you decided to work on that you, that you weren't, uh, talked out of? Um, I really like, uh, one of my favorite from that time, I don't remember exactly when it was. Um, was kind of like playing off that same grocery delivery idea. And it's like, okay, you could really drive down costs by locking into a single supply point mm -hmm. and locking into a single time so that you all orders are originating from the same place and the milk run can be batched as high as you can go, right? Yeah. Like, because it's all coming from one place, you can, you know, just like Amazon delivery works, is like you stack the truck fill of orders and you go do the milk run uh, with, with all, you know, as opposed to like DoorDash or Reeds that um, you have a huge array of origination points and the likelihood that two orders in the same 30 minute period, or like it has to be tighter, it's like in the same 10 minute period are gonna originate from the same spot and need to go to like around the same location is very rare. And so you're mostly just doing one car, one order. Um, but there is, and I don't know, I still think this is a, fin I, like I know this is a fantastic business, uh, and it's always been my backup plan and I can't believe no one's done it. So you should do it. It's so like, I'll give you the numbers. It's such a good business. Um, is coffee is that perfect skew. Uh -huh. It's like the only skew in, in delivery that people want consistency at the same time of day, which is like wild that no one's capitalized on that. Cause like every other skew food, like I don't want to have pad thai every single day coffee. I want the exact same drink from the exact same place every single day at the exact same time. And that kind of consistency is, it doesn't exist in any other SKU. Hmm. Um, and the margins on coffee, you can put that delivery fee. If you get the delivery, you can put it in the margin of the coffee because the coffee is like one eighth product and like f one half uh, service mm -hmm. and the rest is profit. So what we did is like one origination point in a city, we could get that super cheap because we just need a closet, right? And we take that one half that you're putting into the coffee, you just make that stupidly human. Mm -hmm. So we would typewriter out uh, people's names and a little message for them, like, really? a, like a little, little special message, like something, something unique. Um, we had like a little, uh, uh, I don't think we ever ended up piloting it, but like a little little newspaper that comes on your, so you could put, pull it out and like yeah. read news and stuff. Um, but he's like, you can make it like so human. We little door hangers, so it was hanging on your door, wasn't on the, the curb. Um, you can put so much of that service in that the rest of that cost of the coffee is like still come out on top. Um, we were commissioning people to do murals. Um, really? Yeah, because it's like part of coffee is existing in the community, right? Yeah. But there are other ways to exist in community rather than have a brick and mortar store, right? Mm -hmm. You take that money you're going to spend on a brick and mortar store and you put that into like art and uh, being like a really good partner in the community gets you most of the way there. Um, and just making it feel like something like coffee is something that, you know, like we, I, I think this is what a lot of the coffee robotic companies get wrong is like, you're not, you're, you're buying a, a human experience, thing, a human experience. You can make coffee at home, but yeah. you can't have that human touch. Have a smile in the morning. Totally. Someone writing your name. Totally. Out. But um, I, I think you can throw all that into delivery. There's a bunch of different things uh, we had on the roadmap too. Um, we thought sending you a video of someone making it and being like really peppy, <laughs> kind of like a Peloton. Uh -huh. Like as a person could rip out a ton of drinks, but like yeah, yeah, yeah. having someone who has that energy and it's like, hey, 
great to see you again. Like I'm, I'm making your order and like having like a longer relationship with that person um, would be really interesting. Would and this be like app based? Yeah, yeah. It's okay. like so you're just sending it. We had we had an app, um, and uh, we only re we ran this for three months. This is like I was so dumb back then. Um, we did it for three months. It was going really well. Huh. Um, what, 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 what was really well? What does that look like? Like a few thousand dollars in revenue? Yeah. A few hundred customers? Yeah. 50 to 100 orders a day. Okay. Whoa. Um, okay. Yeah, but it was like one coffee. But, yeah. But it was but like still, three months awesome. in, we were ripping. Yeah. Um, this is before delivery apps were a thing in Oklahoma. Um, so you were, we were kind of like onboarding people to the idea of delivery. Um, that's why I still think like today it's even better. Uh, yeah, they'd be such a good business. Um, it kills me not to do that. Especially, I almost did that instead of pipe dream, especially but. with like distribution channels, like short, short form video and stuff. I think that you could probably totally spin up a town very quickly. Totally, totally. And there's things you can do too because it's so consistent. Um, you, you can, you know, you can pull things from uh, Pin Duo Duo. Mm -hmm. uh, like, there's all these like group board. Like, there's so many things you can do to add that experience. Like we thought like the longer the streak of buying, you get like different, better cups. And so you, you improve the experience as you like, you know, uh, are, are a more like a lawyer customer. Game. Yeah. Yeah. With, like, yeah. I think we stuff. never did that one because there was like some questions on, like we felt like that it was also like a little unethical to like try to like, you know, do a streak based thing. But there's like a lot of things that are, are, are better that you could do to add to that experience and make it more human. Um, I think that's what we realized is like you can make that delivery so human because you have so much cash to work with there. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm the, I, like the reason we stopped that one was the guy I was running it with. Um, oh, we had a beautiful machine too. It was gorgeous. Um, it was like all copper. I think I still have it somewhere. It, it was beautiful. Um, we'd found it off Craigslist and got like a dumb deal and like drove that day to go pick it up. Um, Did you the, guys personally make the coffees? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All 100 and then you just go to the That's the only way to do it. Big yeah, because oh, okay. everyone else, like their margins include the brick and mortar and the service. Like you have to be making it, but like uh, the guy was doing it with was a coffee snob and he was making some great cups of coffee. So it was really good. Um, but uh, so he was a bodyguard. So he got a bodyguard um, contract out mm -hmm. of the blue. And he's like, dude, Look at this contract. And I saw it. I was like, you have to take that. That's like a, <laughs> a dumb amount of money for three months. He's like, okay, here's the plan. I'm going to do it for three months. I'm going to come back. We're going to scale this thing. Uh, I'll use this as seed capital and we'll crush it. And so okay. that was the plan. And then I think that contract just kept getting so good. It was like month after month after month after month. He was doing other things. So um, he's drawn away from it. Yeah. Did you have any other things after that where you were considering like this could be the company? I don't think so. I mean, there's just a bunch of stuff that had like, five, 10 customers on a monthly recurring revenue. Um, just stuff that I kind of built in like a day. And uh, Oh, there was one, there was one called Dropcorn. Okay. Um, which is, I think would be a good business. Uh, <laughs> it was good. Uh, so this was 2016. And um, it was like one of the few times I went all in on, on an idea. I, went, I did it for... Um, like five months. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it was great, um, but the idea was uh, so break everything. I think people have tried this before, and I the, the reason I was like, okay, I don't think this is gonna be this. It's like it trends a little hokey. Mm. You got to pull it off just right. But the idea was um, you break everything down into um, I, I should be able to pull up a browser and see all the digital information I need within a quarter mile. So huh. if I'm in a Whole Foods, I should be able to just like pull up, I don't need to download an app, I should be able to pull up a thing and this app have my payment and it has my location and it has my identity and it should be able to interact with like a thin app. Whereas like I should be able to just pull it up, open my camera, scan something, pay for it. And like these little engagement apps that people want to build, they should be able to be built in this environment where you just you pull up an app because your location knows where you are and you can interact with that thing that way instead of like getting in a whole other app and signing up and, and all that. Um, and the idea was that QR codes hadn't caught on at the time. And the idea was that was part of the reason why and there was like this huge gap with like food service and um, restaurants that they had this really big digital component, but getting people to do it on their phones was so hard. And mm. so uh, the idea was like, that was the arbitrage is you can get these restaurants, hey, uh, put this out, um, you know, uh, it's an app, people download it, they, they can uh, enter, um, there's a, a website too, but you just go to Dropcorn, 
you had your location, and then it would give you whatever digital item you needed in that space to interact with your environment. Mm -hmm. So like Menu is great on yep. restaurants. is yep. like the, the killer app. Um, and uh, it was just like really, really, and this was before I was good at sales, like it really, really struggled to like convince people to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was right. I, I think it was inelegant. Um, but uh, it had like, what did it have at peak? Like 10,000 daily active users? 10,000 daily active yeah, users? Yeah, I think how that's right. How many people did you onboard? Like how, how did you onboard people? Because you said you did this in like five months? So I built the, the built first app in, in a months. weekend. Okay. Yeah. So it was because I saw someone like, uh, they were like, um, they were playing guitar at a restaurant. And I was like, I'd love to tip them, but like, but you don't want to have to like go codes. over and, like, or did you even have I didn't have, have cash. cash, no yeah. cash. And I was okay. like, I just wish I knew it was Finmo. Mm -hmm. And it's just before QR codes. And like at that time, I don't even remember QR codes that existed in China for years. And the, the, the likelihood that people in the US were going to start using them was nothing. I had no confidence QR codes were going to take off, um, which was a bummer because I, I loved QR codes. Uh, but I was like, man, it'd be so great to just like have a high likelihood that if I pull up this app, he would have had his like, I would be able to see his Venmo because he was also in the you same space. You have a profile, right? And he, right. You'd know that you know. And he could say, "Just go dropcorn.com." Mm -hmm. You pull it up, and then like all his information's there because he's he's within your vicinity. Oh, and so you'd actually kind of have like each person that signed up, they would have a personal profile, and then it would you'd like give it access to their location. And mm -hmm. so anytime they went into a new space, it would just automatically populate that new space. That was with, the idea. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. Cool. Um, and there was like a paid component to like, you know, there uh, make sure that someone like that would want to be at the top because they're most useful. So, um, but that was the idea. So I just like built it uh, that night. I stayed up all night and I built it, launched it in the next day, put it on Reddit. Um, it didn't do that good. But then it just like started to have like this word of mouth effect and started growing mm -hmm. and growing and growing and growing. And um, it was kind of like airdrop for everyone, right? Like Android, otherwise, I think that's what a lot of people are using it for. Like if you're giving a presentation being like, hey, here's the copy of the presentation. Like I just put it on Dropcorn and anyone in the art team can just go and Dropcorn and download it. Um, and there was like a color code system we had. There was like four different colors. If you didn't have a location, there was like a bar you put at the end. It'd be like red, yellow, blue, green, and it'd put you to that location um, or like close enough to it. Uh, so you didn't actually have your have your location on. There's like other ways to interact with that. But it was like, was the easiest way to just be like, I have a set amount of digital things that you can either interact with, whether it's a poll or like, I just need me and your digital identity just need to be linked somehow, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, something needs to know that we're in the same place. I um, mean, the idea was that if we could get a good enough coverage that when AR and VR came online at some time in the next like two decades, like you already had a good sense of like who owned this like digital space. Uh, so it's like clearing, you know, like if you own a grocery store, you should own the digital space. Hmm. It should be like, when you go in, you should be able to interact with things. And, and like, that is a very helpful thing. I shouldn't have to like download another app or it should just be like, I'm already here. I want to interact with this digitally. It should just be there. Uh, I think it was ultimately a horrible idea. Uh, I don't Why? think it was great. Uh, it was just like convoluted. Okay. It was like one of those great, like early, like everyone has to get through their like, I wish the world just worked efficiently, but it doesn't. And I think like everyone has a version of that. It's like a note-taking app or an events page. Or to-dos. To-dos, yeah. Um, something where you're like, oh, my version of this is gonna crush. Everyone's gonna love it. Uh, and then you realize, oh, nope, that's not how it works. <laughs> like, and everyone has to have one of those things and then you move past it. But it's like, it's part of the growing up process. You gotta do it. Yeah. You have to act on that great idea. You learn so much. Um, probably won't work. We should go for it. Like, I, I think, I don't know if you've done one of those. I, I started learning to code and then I got terrible tendonitis and then had to stop learning to code. Ooh, yeah. yikes. Yeah. Oh so that's man, that's I, tough. I stopped doing that. Um, Sorry about that, man. Yeah. Anyway, um, why did you initially or eventually decide that it just wasn't the thing and you just like you had 10,000 users coming back to this app daily Yeah. and you decided to shut it down? How did that work? What'd you do there? I'm fine. This is like a long time. It was right, right after I got out of college. Um, I don't remember, but I remember like the, the traction wasn't enough to like justify spending justify all your time it, on no. it. And, and that was around the time where I decided to take two years and shut mm -hmm. everything I was doing down. And, and like, I like, yeah. So let's talk about that. You said yeah. like you graduated college mm -hmm. and then you decided to take two years to like 
I think like build a bunch of different businesses to try to like pay your rent and yeah. So there's like there wasn't a specified time. Okay. I was just like, okay, I'm gonna like if I I don't don't get an engineering job that felt like the worst, right? And I think like in retrospect, I would have just taken a job at a startup that would have been better, but I didn't have exposure to that, so mm-hmm. that wasn't an option. Um, so I was like, okay, I need to learn business. What's the best way to do it? Feels like the best way to do it is just like have to make money with business in mm-hmm. order to survive. Um, kind of like, you know, pushing baby bread out of nefs and learn to fly on the way down. That was the thinking. So if like I had to make my rent, um, odds are it's kind of like you refined your thinking mm-hmm. and you have to do it. Um, so you'll you figure it out. And that, that was my thought. Um, so I just like, I did that for I think like a year. It was so fun. Uh, it was like the funnest time of my life. I was making horrible app. Like they weren't great. Some of them were great. Can we, Some can of we actually by. like talk about a few of the a few of the things that you built during mm-hmm. that year? Yeah. So what was the, like, um, the first one? Good question. Maybe, maybe package alert. What was that? Uh, package alert. So this was like before storage lockers. So um, I just followed my my apartment manager around. I was like, can I just like follow you around for the day and like write down problems? They're like, I guess, I guess. So I did it for like, I think like six hours, like 11 to whenever, um, to them to work. So I was just writing down things and like people coming in to check in to see if the package had been dropped off was like happening all day, huh? like all day. Uh, people were just coming in, coming in, coming in, coming in. And I was like, is this a like a normal day? Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh yeah, it's the worst. Um, I was like, okay, like how bad? enough that you'd pay for it. You're like, oh, I'd, I'd love to fix it. So I went and talked to other property managers. They're all like, yeah, oh, people are coming in all day. We we're talking about like, it's, it's great to hear about people's horrible first ideas. Just mm-hmm. you know, like, you, like everyone has horrible first ideas. They're, they're awful. And like, they're usually like great ideas that win pitch competitions and just like are not going to work in the world. And you got to like figure out like why. Why is something a great idea that won't work in the real world? And then you realize like, oh, you got to like build towards a problem and the solution is dynamic and you got to find the right way to solve the problem and, and picking a solution from the start is never going to get you there. Um, great example of this was gift wrappers. Okay. I loved gift wrappers. It was like I thought of it and I was like, got to build that today. So I, uh, um, oh, I had another one in college. Okay, I did have a bunch in college. Okay, let's just do gift wrappers. Gift wrappers. Gift wrappers, gift wrappers rocked. One. So gift wrappers... I don't know if it could work today. Maybe. It'd be like an okay one-person business. Um, no, nah, I probably wouldn't work today. But it, four years ago, it would have. Uh, so the idea was there's a lot of rappers who are really talented and weren't making a lot of money. How? But people love personalized raps. Two markets. You know, there's a lot of supply, a lot of demand. Let's connect those. You know? Mm-hmm. You can hire a rapper. And this is before Cameo or, or anything like that. Hire a rapper to make a song about your friend or an event or something. And like you work with rappers who are just really good without knocking stuff out. Yeah. Cause they're super quick, right? It's like basically improv. You sit on the mic and you're like, you improv it. Um, and so I found the rappers, I found local rappers. They were great. They were great. I was like, Oh, this is too easy. This is so good. Um, start the business. Uh, I, 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 for a while I was still paying for the domain cause I just loved it as like a museum piece of like, how things can go so wrong. Um, but it did not Wait, work. What was the domain? Gift wrappers. Gift wrappers. Okay, gift okay. wrappers without the W. Oh, gift okay. wrappers. Nice. Yeah. Great. <laughs> yeah, I loved it. <laughs> um, it did come up with the business before the name, but as soon as I thought of the name, I was like, well, now nah, I got to do it. No, you it's do too it. good. <laughs> uh, rappers turns out not great at sticking to deadlines. Mm. A horrible experience. Um, there's a reason. <laughs> That, uh, you know, and like, I, I, I love it. Like no one's a rapper because they're like, oh, I'm so efficient. Right. Like I, I can, I can, you know, I'm, I'm just going to like, you know, they have something to say. And so they don't want to like, just sit there and talk about like, you know, um, welcome to this charity event. And mm-hmm. you know, you got a great life. They don't want to do that. They want to like have something to say. And so it's just not interesting and they're going to work on their stuff. And just like, I could not, I could you not couldn't make it work. Couldn't make it work. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not a good market. Um, the other one was, oh, I applied to YC with it. That was the first time I applied to YC. We could even what go through the YC was it experiences. Called? <laughs> I think it was one of the only times I applied to YC. Mm-hmm. So the idea was, um, uh, God, what was it called? It had a great name. 
I don't remember. But the idea was that um, uh, people gave money in really like inconsistent ways, mm -hmm. but not because they didn't want to, because the connection process was haphazard and didn't spark joy, right? So like, do you want to give money to help people? Obviously. W now what? <laughs> yeah. Right? Because it's like, it's like a friction-filled process and it doesn't, like, I would love to open up Twitter, but I'm not going to go open up the charity giving, like, I'm not, GoFundMe. I'm not like, you're going to go hit GoFundMe and be like, ha, oh, sparks joy. Right? So how do you flip that on its head mm. so that um, you can create like a, a, a flywheel effect? So the idea was a uh, $5 a month subscription and four or five dollars, you got a certain amount of coins to give to to charity, and then people were were on the app, and you could like, you would get a notification like you need to give. It's time to give your coins, and then you'd be like, oh, you time to give, give my coins. You, you I pay for the coins. Like, I'm such a good person. Coin, 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 coin. Throw, throw them out, you know. And then the idea was um, from that market, like that's not you're not ever going to make money from that, but um, uh, people could give you more coins as discounts to other services. So like Target be like, oh, we're giving out, you know, 1% today. If you shop with us, we'll give you 1% back in, God, I had such a great name, blank coin. And so then you get more coins. It was a write off for them because they're not actually giving you the money. They're gonna send that money to that organization. Mm -hmm. um, but then you were like, oh, more coins to give. So you create like a, a, a you want- A very positive feedback loop and totally. like flywheel for yeah. almost like gamifying the, uh, the that was the experience. thought, yeah. And then you could like, you know, because it was such a low amount, my thought was people, could, you could kind of like pressure your friends into, it's $5 a month. You don't have $5 a month to give to charity, are you serious? Uh, you, <laughs> low enough, yeah. like start, that you could create like the social network of like, oh, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so gave their blank coins. Uh, what was it? They give their blank coins to this and then you should give it to this. And then it's like, but you're giving like a little bit. And so then you can increase it, but like you're gaining exposure to these causes mm -hmm. through like a really high dopamine interaction. Yeah. Um, Wait, and so how did you apply to YC with that? What was your... Oh, they used to have a nonprofit. Oh, they, yeah, they did. Yeah, they, they did. Had, was yeah. it like $100,000 or was it 125? Just where they yeah. just like... Yeah, 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 it, yeah. And you'd be in the same cohort, yeah. but you'd be doing a philanthropic nonprofit. Thing. Yeah, it was, it was like, I think it was 2012 um, when I applied. Oh, so you were actually like just going to just college. barely in college interesting yeah. was this yeah. when you like discovered the uh well didn't you discover the paul graham essays in 2014 or like oh i don't know when afterwards? i read, i don't know it's sometime during college because i would totally it would totally make sense to me for you to discover the paul graham essays and then be like and oh then, like, YC, that's 100 percent how it happened yeah that's okay maybe that's the okay. coin was not 20 oh somewhere in there it's <laughs> some i uh i'm the worst at dates it's all good Somewhere, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, it was in there. So after after you did like, I guess you said, you decided you thought that you were gonna do two years, mm -hmm. I believe, or you said you didn't have an end date. Mm -hmm. um, but then you decided to go and work for what was it? Um, so I was already working for Modern Bionics. Modern Bionics. Um, just yeah, like yeah. I worked out there? a part time thing with them. There I was working two days a week. Uh -huh. I basically did whatever. So I, I went on as like a design engineer because I've always wanted to work at prosthetics. And then anytime I heard a problem, I was like let me just knock that out today. Huh. And I will like anything people were like, we can't do that. I'd be like, oh, I'll figure it out. Just let, let me have it. Or I would just like hear it and then like send the owner an email later on being like, hey, okay, that thing you wanted done, it's done. Um, like, oh, people say it's taking too long to make an app. Here's your app you wanted. It's yeah. done. That was probably the one that got me like most endeared was like people were like how much it was going to cost to make an app. And he was like, surely it's not because it's just you're hitting buttons. Like, it can't be that hard. You're just hitting buttons. Like, why is it going to cost $50,000 in, like, four months? Because um, it was they, they wanted an app for people refitting their sockets because it was a dynamic mm. socket, so you could change it throughout the day, but it had to be changed in, like, certain configurations. So they just wanted an app that was like, okay, I want to increase the, um, uh, it was like the posterior lateral diameter. I'm so bad at remembering this kind of stuff. Um, and then everything else doesn't need to ch change proportionally. So it was like so simple. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I was just, I went online. This is where I got introduced to no code. And I was like, make a app easy. <laughs> and then I went through it. I was like, okay, no, that's going to work. Uh, but I saw like someone being like, oh, you can make a, a visual app. And I was like, okay, for prototyping. Mm -hmm. That'll take me like close enough. So I built the app there and I was like, okay, that's close. But I need to ship it. And they're like, we can't. I was like, okay, surely there's something to ship. And then so I went through it. I finally found Bubble. Um, which started like a lifelong love of bubble. 
um, yeah. to this day. I love I that platform this so much. Yeah. Uh, and I found that I was like, oh, I can ship an app with that. That's crazy. And so then I built it the rest of the night. And then the next morning, uh, when the owner came in, I was like, hey, uh, open up this URL. And I sent it to him. And he's like, this is the app. It's like, it's the app. <laughs> we did it. Um, yeah. And so from then on, they just like anything that was like too hard to figure out, they would give me and I'd go figure it out. Wait, and so I loved you, it. Were you like doing software development kind of uh, for my Martin Bionics? That was part of it. And then I okay. did just a bunch of other stuff too. Um, okay. So I did like some acquisition stuff, some real estate stuff, some banking stuff. I did like anything that was like above a certain difficulty threshold, um, I would go do. Um, the owner, Jay Martin, who rocks, I love him to death. Uh, great entrepreneur. Um, he always say like, uh, Garrett's core skill is he's like the best Google searcher. <laughs> <laughs> I would just keep looking until I found the answer. Like just knowing like there's probably an ant the world seven billion people and you're telling me there's not an answer to like blank thing. It's just too buried. Uh, so I'd always just like you know run the you know Google, Google gives you a lot of returns. Mm -hmm. You just like you keep looking through those things. You usually find the answer. It's usually in there somewhere. Um, so that's why I just kept doing it. Which just like he had this great ability to be like, I think I learned it from him to be like, this thing feels simple. Thus it should be. And there's probably difficulty being added to it. Most likely. And sometimes it was wrong. Um, but I saw him like people hated that. No one liked working for him. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I loved it. He was, I loved working for him. I would go work for him again to this. Like, I love it. But, um, but he was right. Most of the time, it's like things are that simple. If they feel simple, they should be simple. Jeff Bezos has a great line, like, if if common sense and data disagree, then the data is probably wrong. Mm. Or it was like something, some version of that, um, which is counterintuitive, especially in like kind of a, you know, I think, get into it, but like, it, 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 we feel like we have so much data and we don't. Like we really live in a data poor society. And a lot of the time the data has implicit bias. And so anytime there's a conflict, that's usually where like really great ideas lie and people where we think we have the data for something we don't. And the reality is that something is very different than what it, what people are telling us, right? Yeah. And usually like, like, yeah, so that's what we did. It was like, he'd have this thing that people would tell him like, you can't do that. And he'd be like, but it seems really simple. And be like, well, it's not really that simple. Then he'd go to me and be like, hey, this thing seems really simple. And I'm like, all right, let's go for it. Let's try to like figure out how to make it simple. And then that thing would usually exist. And he'd go back and tell everyone, like, we did it. <laughs> and um, people did not like him for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I wanted to talk with you about uh, Jeff Bezos. And that's, mm. this is, like, a perfect segue to that. Uh, what what have you learned from him? Like, when did you start, you know, watching his yeah. videos or whatever? Um, and what have you learned from them? What have you learned from him? Yeah. Um, I think I just learned that... Um, like he is so good at having systems for things mm. and they, they, they change, right. And they're, they're dynamic systems, but not a ton. And I think the idea of like a good system applied ubiquitously, that's where the magic is, right? Like we need those, especially to work in groups, right? We need to have a common, it doesn't have to be great. I think that's, that's, I, I feel that like, it doesn't have to be a perfect system. It just has to be good. But that good across everything is so efficient. Um, like their bar raiser program for hiring is just like, I can't believe no, no one else uses it. It's so good. It's such an efficient, well thought out process. Like he runs the whole organization like an API with like little groups that have, are just well documented. And if you need to interact with this group, there's documentation exists to like work with that group and take like the human out of it. And then they have like a natural cleansing process of like the whole organization and they make sure they're bringing in the best people. And it like, it's just so such a good system. And I know he got like so much, he had to have got so much flack for it early on. Um, and I get it. Like we have systems that I think really helped us build pipe dream into what it is today. The better that system, the more it's been attacked of like, really? do we really need this thing? What have been the biggest, uh, like vectors of attack? Like what, what have been the probably on the ones? one that was the most helpful. Okay. Which is, um, our version of bar razor. Cause there's not like a good version of bar razor for Amazon that exists for a really early company. Mm -hmm. um, so what we adopt is like, okay, if like the, the whole idea is like, there's, there's a um, great people create great momentum. Yep. And it means that you don't have to be there for them to make a great decision. And that those people are really hard to find. And the cost of ha not having that person in somewhere 
is a drain on the organization. And so you, you have to get these great people that fit your culture and it's really, 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 really hard. And it's really hard to hold that bar when there are so many other biases. Do I like this person? Does this person seem cool? Do I know this person? Did someone vouch for this? Those are all biases against like finding out if they're a great person. And so the Bar Razor program at Amazon is so good at like solving those implicit biases. So mm -hmm. we, we, we adopted a version, do the same thing like write up what you think of the person, ask them different questions. It's all blind. You pass to the next person, you don't tell them anything. Um, and then you review all together. But our bar raiser was every person we bring in has to be so good that when you look at them versus the rest of the group, it's like embarrassing. It's like slap over the so head, so much yeah. better. It's like that person shouldn't work here. Um, but you only have to do that a few times before like talent begets talent and you end up like with insane talent. Mm -hmm. um, but there was never a time, it, it was always so interesting, it's like almost poetic, like uh, Ken, our CTO, the day we found him, we had a four hour discussion that was like, we have to give this up. We've gone through a hundred plus candidates. Several are great candidates. And they're, yeah, they're not better than us, but like they're close, they're like as good. And we are slowing down the organization just to like look for like this unicorn. And finally, I, like being, being down, being down, I was like, fine, okay, whatever. Like, let's do it. Two hours later, we found Cannon. And then it was so clear, he was so far above, like so clear he was so far above and just thought in a different way. It was so aggressive. I've never worked with someone who works as hard as I do. He is that hard of a worker or better. And like, I can't imagine where we'd be without him. But it's just funny, it's like, that we would have never found him had we not said no to that many people. Um, and same thing across like other hires, like very similar stories. Yeah, I'd be curious. So you talked about like curiosity being one of the most important factors mm -hmm. for making a hiring, hiring decision and that you really look for people that have like autonomously built interesting projects and stuff in the mm -hmm. past. What have been the like most interesting cases of you finding someone? Oh my gosh, it's Thomas Goddens. Okay. Thomas Goddens. Please don't push him. But you should. You should try. Because uh, he deserves the <laughs> world. Like, you should try, try to get him, and he will change your life. Uh, Thomas Goddens is the best engineer. And people think, like, okay, I think they really like this guy. Then they work with him. They're like, no, it's true. He's the best engineer. Got to be. Got to be top 10 in the world. Like, he is ridiculous. Um, but his, his portfolio is obviously that. Um, I don't know to this day how we got him. I think it was like, in his words, he was like, oh, I've never met someone as passionate about robotics as Canon. I just had to be around that. So it was like, credit to Canon. But when, when uh, Canon sent me his portfolio, he's like, okay, uh, this clearly is above that bar. Uh, look at this portfolio, the best portfolio I've ever seen. And it was just a mix of the most off the wall, interesting projects done so elegantly. His, uh, his portfolio page, he has like this box that rotates on its corner and like floats and like his project page have all these little Easter eggs. Like we had gone through it like five times before we realized that this lightning pattern was generating every time you open the page based on like a like closest fit algorithm. It was like insane. Uh, and yeah, he's it, like anyone who works with him, you like, we tell him like, okay, like Thomas is a genius and also the nicest person you'll ever meet. Mm -hmm. We were like, okay, well you guys like, you know, um, uh, you talk in superlatives, which is true, but like, also he is a genius and the nicest person you ever meet. And anyone's like, oh, you were kidding. Uh, like, and even if we bring in an, an like senior electrical engineer, that person's like, Thomas is really helpful. Uh, and if I, have, if I have a question, I go to him, uh, and he'll hate that. He won't watch, like, I hope he doesn't watch this, but he is the best. It is such an honor to work with him. Um, that's the best example. And we've never brought on someone with a killer portfolio page and them not turned out in, to be great. And we've brought on people without a portfolio page and it's reinforced how important that is. Yep. Even how, they look good. How fast are you able to make decisions when you recognize, like, I know that, actually, let's talk about this. Uh, One-way doors and two-way doors. Mm -hmm. I know this is a huge yeah. like framework that you're constantly using. What, yeah. what, what, um, what do you use it for in this business? Um, so a lot of like protocol layer stuff. So like a lot, a lot of this stuff, um, the, the goal is to make it really simple and really applicable across a, across a whole uh, host of applications, right? So to do that, a lot of these individual components 
uh, need to be applicable across the line, and they need to be interoperable. And so a lot of them, like um, the diameter of the pipe and the, what the rail it's riding on and all of that are not quite one-way doors, but kind of because of how long it takes to develop them. And so those are the ones we have the hardest conversations. Ken's really good at teeing these up. He'll do a ton of research and like lay out a really good argument and then we'll argue about it for a while. And like, mm -hmm. you know, we gotta remind ourselves that's good. Like we should be arguing um, high conviction. Ken always says like, um, you don't know if like, oh, he has a great quote. Okay, it doesn't quite apply to this. I think it's like his best version of the quote is like the person with the most give a shit is probably right. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Like like the best decisions we've made have been someone just like stand like I'm I'm holding conviction here, and we go with it. It turns out to be right. Yeah, um, that's actually even similar to the the Bezos thing where it's like the intuition and the, if the mm -hmm. intuition data mm -hmm. aren't yeah. aligning, it's yeah. probably the intuition. Yeah. It's really strong. Yeah, conviction. and especially if you bring on people who have high give a shit. Mm -hmm. uh, I really hope my mom doesn't watch this now. Uh, <laughs> uh, if they have high give a shoot, um, then uh, and they have it innately, they're only going to do that on things that they care a lot about, and they're probably right. Like, but they, you you can't bring on people who don't care a lot. Otherwise, they're going to raise concerns that don't matter, and you know they'll just want to feel smart one day, and they'll like make something a big deal. It's uh, bike shedding is a great. Uh, I don't know if you know what bike shedding is. Nope. Bike shedding. Um, so uh, the idea is someone is building a nuclear reactor and they bring the nuclear reactor uh, in front of the executives and the executives look at it and they don't understand the nuclear reactor. And so people go like, anyone have any questions? Well, no one doesn't want to have no questions. So they say, oh, the bike shed should be purple, not blue. And I, that is a must. <laughs> and so it's just like you say something to feel smart and be heard and because you have to, right? And that is like I I like I found myself doing that so much. Like when when you do when you are supposed to be the smartest person, but you're clearly I'm not here, right? Um, you can like feel the need to be like, I should say you're something. You're leading the company and you're supposed <laughs> to have the vision. I should have a everything. question, yeah. yeah. Um but like those kind of people do that if they don't care. And then people who care are like, I, I don't care about this shit because I care so much about like the thing yeah. we're trying to do. Um, and when I raise a concern, it should be listened to because like I'm saying it because I care so much. And Ken's point is like, you can't teach that. You can't, like, that is innate. It is innate when you show up to the project and then it should be really cared for. Um, but you, it, you can't create that in someone. Um, and he's right. Yeah. Uh, so like those are the one way doors we fight about. Um, hiring, hiring's where we always argue. I, I think it's more one way door. I, I think hiring should be treated like it's a one-way door. I don't think hire fast, fire fast. Um, when, when you're doing something in hardware is right. Why do you think it's wrong? Yeah, I, I actually, I don't know if I'm right here. I, I think this is the thing that like we discuss internally the most. Um, I could be 100% wrong. Uh, I think there is you need to feel like it's an environment of high failure mm. and where that's okay. And I think higher fast, failure fast, fire fast taxes that. It creates a culture of people not necessarily wanting to, to mess up. You, I, I also want to go back to when you were thinking about like which businesses to start, you went to actual small businesses, right? And mm -hmm. you would, uh, after you learned to code, was this in bubble? Were you oh, all in bubble. bubble. Okay. Oh my gosh. So you learned yeah. to code in bubble, uh, and you're like going from small business to small business or something like this, uh, asking them what their problems are, mm -hmm. and then trying to like come up with solutions to build with software. Yeah. Um, and then you would like go home oh at my night. Gosh. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> yeah. Build, yeah build and then it. you would build it. Tell me about Woo. and like sell it back to sell <laughs> the solution back to them. Yeah. Uh, tell me about that story. Um, like this process. I didn't. I can't remember how many times I did it. Um. But yeah, I think pa Package Alert was a good example of that. That one probably did the best. Only one that you really did was with the package delivery, or did there you other do ones others? I did? That was the one that like I remember the most. I'd have to go into my bubble and like go back because I have them all saved. I have like four bubble accounts because <laughs> they keep changing the pricing, mm -hmm. but they grandfather the old account in. Oh, okay. So I, you can't make any more. But I, uh, so I have I have great pricing on my original one. Um, insane. But uh, yeah, so I, like. I have like this whole list of like all the apps that I made. Um, 
Can you talk about the process for thinking about what variables you can and can't control, and then deciding what to optimize and what uh, what the simplest like robot that meets all those requirements is? Mm. All that entire process. Kane's a lot better at this than I am. That's what. Yeah, that's what is was this in my Kanan's note. question? No, no, no. Oh, this, okay. is, this is not Kanan's question. <laughs> this is just like I, I heard you talking about this in the other interview say, last say, night. Is, is Kanan like, fishing for me to talk about how great he is? <laughs> he should. Um, no, Kanan's great at that. Um, yeah, I. It's. I mean, there's. I don't. I don't know if we're great at it. Kanan's really good. Okay. Um, there's not many people who are great at it. I, I think it's really hard. I mean, it's the same thing as like making great products, like trying to decide like what is actually important and what's not important. Um, what's Elon say? Like the the biggest uh, the biggest delete, mistake. Delete, delete. Yeah, but <laughs> it's like the biggest mistake a smart engineer makes is optimizing a process that should never exist, mm -hmm. or optimizing a part that should never exist. Um, but yeah, delete, delete, delete. Um, and actually, it, you should delete. It, you should be deleting so much that yeah, you have to at that. least add some back end yeah. because you deleted too much. Totally. Uh, Canon's really good at that. Um, Canon is like I, I think like a lot of a lot of stuff in business is about like your just how good you are at um, having good mental processes. Yeah, so Canon's really good at this. Canon's great at it, and I think so much of being good at startups is just how good are you at removing your biases. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of my favorite. I, I give this I wanna, book to yeah, everyone. I oh, okay. Have this, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what, um, well, no, go on, go on, do your thing. So much of it is removing your biases. Um, Jeff Bezos has a great point of this. Like, the, the it is really tough to make good decisions. Um, such that, like, even Jeff Bezos, like, if I can make three good decisions a year, I'm golden baby. I'm good. I don't think he says it like that, but <laughs> that's how I imagine him saying it. Um, it's actually very similar to Warren Buffett, who's like, I think he wants to make one good decision every like five years or something like this. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, and he does. <laughs> um, yeah, I think same thing in engineering. Uh, sunk cost bias is a B word. Um, <laughs> uh, the, uh, threw myself I off. Actually have a, I actually have a question in here um, about, you talked a lot about bias. Mm. Like you, you are, yeah. Every single interview that I've seen you do, mm -hmm. you're talking about bias mm -hmm. and how to avoid it. Uh, like what are, or at least bias in, in general. Mm -hmm. What initially turned you onto that? And then like, how do you avoid uh, having bias in decision making and stuff like that? Oh yeah, I knew exactly what it was. Um, so when I was, it was in between that, like when I realized like, oh, okay, making decisions wrong, I've got to go figure out this other stuff. Um, that I was working at a aerospace company called Falcon Jet in Little Rock, oh, Arkansas. Okay. Um, they make private uh, airplanes. Was this the internship? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Dang, <laughs> you knew about the internship? That's crazy. I just did. It was Do your research. And so I didn't want to like, you know, ask about it, but yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in fact, I loved it. Um, I got engaged in Little Rock. I love Little Rock. Um, but I had a lot of time. So I'll go to the library and just like pull in books. I'm like pop all day. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm like rolling through catalogs. I'm like trying to just like absorb as much as I can. So I would go to the library and be like for like, different things like business. And I just go check out a ton of business books. I'd start reading them. When one I was like, okay, this one's not good. I just like, and I just, I'd, I'd get like so many books at a time. And I was going and I was picking out um, psychology books about like how to think clearly. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was close to thinking clearly because I grabbed a book right next to a book that said art of thinking clearly. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's what I want to do. It's like, all right, let's check this one out. And I went through all those books and like, all the books I got, got about like how to like think really well. Mm -hmm. um, once I started reading Art of Thinking Clearly, I realized like oh, I can kind of get rid of all these. This one, this is it. This is the book, uh, and I love that book. I love the book so much. It's like I don't even know if I agree with it, <laughs> like all of it. Yeah. But the way that it lays out really clearly, like okay, here's this mental process that you probably like evolved because from our hunter gatherer stage, like there's this way that you think in a way that your, your, your brain helps you make decisions, right? It helps you distill all these variables down to like really easy way to think. Here's how it affects your life and why it's bad and fit to modern life. And here's how you assess it and avoid it. And that is, I think about that book every single day. Really? Um, oh my gosh, yeah. I mean, uh, a lot of them come down to like sunk cost bias and success bias are like the biggest ones, but there are so many. We, we, were, we were just talking about one, um, we were grabbing dinner the other day. What was mm -hmm. it? Um, Definitely commitment and consistency. Uh, or was it um, people feel safe when they have an overabundance of data? 
even if the data is wrong. I don't know what that would bias would be called though. I, I always forget the name of that one. Anyways, it's it's like a it's like, I think it's ninety two biases that the book lays out, and yeah. each bias is one chapter. Yeah. Um, so that that in zero to one is what I give everyone who starts. At yeah, have train. you read Poor, Poor Charlie's Almanac? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm I ordered it yesterday. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because I was like, I'm gonna buy him Poor Charlie's Almanac. It was um, so good. You were, I never heard uh, those quotes before. They were so good. Yeah, they're bangers. Yeah. Um, the, the, the funny thing is, like, when I was initially studying business, um, there's a whole bunch of scammy people out there on the internet trying to sell you yeah. stuff, and then you start listening to Warren Buffett and Charlie yeah. Munger, and you're like, holy shit, these people just think incredibly clearly. And the entire time that they're talking, you're just like nodding and you're like, intuitively, this does make sense. I wouldn't have come up with it on my own, yeah. but like, you know, uh, anyway, but so, so that was a huge impact on me. Yeah. Right. Well, um, uh, is there anything else in that, um, like kind of book, like you have poor Charlie's Almanac, anything else of just like, how do you think clearly about business or otherwise that you have? I mean, the, the, the way that I did it is I just basically put in the reps through like listening to yeah. the Berkshire Hathaway meetings and- No way. Well, did I tell you about this? No. Okay, so I listened to every single, so Berkshire Hathaway has meetings from 1994 to 2023, um, and they're each like four to six hours long, and I've listened to all of them 12 times. And so you just- Let's go. Yeah, yeah. so you just Heck like, yeah. you know, just pound them. Worth it? Thing, absolutely, but the thing is, is like, people think that if you just, I mean, I don't know why we think this way, but we think that if you read something, mm -hmm. that you just like know it, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. not the way that it works. Yeah. You you have to like pound back in the stuff that you want to remember and retain yeah. and have like build an intuition. So that was my thought was like, basically I just spend as much time as I possibly can mm -hmm. learning from these folks. And then I just start intuitively mm -hmm. finding great people and yeah. doing business the right way. And just like the bad ideas never even come in yeah. because I'm, I have such strong pattern matching yeah. for the good ideas. Yeah. Um, anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. It takes a lot of reps to like load the systems into your brain. You got to like really force that. In that was like two and a half thousand hours. So yeah. I mean, that's a Ooh. lot of reps. Yeah. You know, paid off. Yeah. And the other nice thing is like if you do it while you're working out, then I don't know. I don't There's have something any research there. Around I know. That, there but, is like, something there. I guarantee there. you, your brain is working better and willing to retain more information while you're working out. And like, yeah. I don't know why. It's probably yeah. a bunch of like endorphins being released or something. Um, There's something there. Yeah. So I would like to hear about your thought process for. Initially, I believe that you were going, when you were first starting Pipe Dream, you were like thinking about the drones, I think. Mm -hmm. And then you like went ground and then decided to go underground. Uh, or tell me about that. Yeah, no, no, that's right. So there, there was like something before that. Okay, what um, was that? Oh, that was just thinking about, uh, so I had done like all this stuff, right? And it was like, okay, what, 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 was, what was the common wrongness of all mm. this stuff? is it was just stuff I'd like thought of an idea and I was just gonna go and build it, which I think is really important to do. Like you gotta get those reps in. Um, but it was like, all of this is like done really haphazardly, right? It's just like, here's this idea, it could be good, we're gonna try it. Um, but there are like a lot of the biggest businesses are built on these like really refined thesis of like, this is what the future will look like. This is an outcome that will, will be possible and let's go build towards that outcome. And that's where all the big businesses are, are, are built off of. And they're built over a really long period of time. Um, so I think like I, I, I noticed like really early on that uh, I was like burning and churning ideas, right? Like the things that were, I was just like, okay, I'm gonna go find another. But I was like, the things that worked almost were worse because like uh, who, God, I, I, we were just talking about this. Is it Socrates or Plato or one of those guys? is like the things you own end up owning you, which is so true. Yep. Like these things that were like semi-successful is like, oh my God, I'm, I'm like, I have to deliver for this thing and I have no choice, right? I'm not in charge. Like this thing is in charge. So I was, you know, I was thinking I, I need to do one thing and I need to do it for a long time. It needs to be something that I'm so passionate about. I'm okay with it, like taking over my life mm -hmm. and me being kind of subservient to it. So... The, the parameters I laid out is I, I wanted something that had 10 years of growth in it mm -hmm. that I could do for, for 10 years. Um, and it needed to be something uh, that Jeff Bezos' has a great line about um, you want to work in an industry where, what's he say? Where, where things aren't going to change. Aren't where, going where, to change. Aren't going to change. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Over the long term. I called it like you just want to know exactly where the puck is going. And like logistics is that things will get cheaper and faster. And if things are cheaper and faster, you win. Um, so it's great. And there was also like logistics. We looked at a bunch of other stuff too, but logistics was this thing. 
I've been passionate about it my whole life. Like grocery delivery, coffee delivery, even down to like just like the the Garmin app that I was working on was really the I love things happening and coming to you. It's just magic. Like I love the magic of it. And I love the like, I think there's like these little things uh, that change in your life when you have mm -hmm. access to faster delivery. And I think as growing up, I, I just, I loved those little things. I thought they were so cool. Um, you know, I, I, was it Bezos who talked about it or someone else on the team? So there, there's a great story about people saying like, do people care about two day delivery? Like, does it matter? Like, it's so funny to hear that now. We're like, oh my gosh, it changed everything. We like fundamentally changed everything. Uh, about the way that we interact with objects to go down to two days. And even that is like so crazy slow. So if we get that faster, cheaper, make it an afterthought to, to, to get something delivered. And then like, as we start thinking about, okay, what, what happens after that? It's like, whoa, now if you can have things autonomously delivered to you, if you could also send them back, that's where it's like, that, that was, that was when we decided. Why is that such an unlock? Why is being able to send stuff back such an unlock? Yeah, it, it's really similar to, um, I don't know if you're old enough to remember uh, buying movies on iTunes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was with VCRs and like DVDs and oh, stuff. Okay. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but buying movies on iTunes felt like the pinnacle of tech. It was like, yo, you can download it. That's crazy. Um, but it would take like three, four hours to download if you wanted like HD. And then somebody like, oh, it's going to take forever. I'll get the SD version. Um, but it takes so long to download your computer uh, that by the time you've bought it for full price, and download it, you're like, I'm just gonna leave this on my computer, uh, keeping local storage. I don't know if I'll need it again, but I've already bought it, I don't wanna download it again, so it's just like there. And then you have like all these movies on your iTunes. Um, that's how we interact with commerce today, because it does take a few hours, or even like 30 minutes. It, it takes time to get to you. Like in the best case scenario, it's taken 30 minutes. Um, and because of that, uh, we have all this stuff in local storage and our homes are local storage and our offices are local storage. I have a bunch of stuff that I may need this year, one or two times. So it's really important that I have it on hand. I have quick access to it. So um, if we have that consistent, really fast delivery and then also being able to make it really easy to send back, then now we're interacting with commerce the same way that we interact with movies on Netflix. We take flyers. Like, I don't know what movie I, I, I want to watch tonight. I don't have to make that big of a decision. Like, I can just be like, yeah, I'm going to wear that shirt today. I know it's going to get here in 10 minutes. I'm going to wear it. And after this party, I'm going to, I'm just going to drop it in and send it back. Um, that across all verticals, I think, changes a lot. A lot of our homes are there to manage and make efficient our local storage, mm -hmm. right? Washing machines, drying machines, dishwasher, uh, refrigerator, all of these are there to, because we have to keep so much in local storage. Grocery stores are built that way. They're built to sell you a lot of stuff in bulk. So you can have it in bulk and store it in kind of like on the edge. Um, there's a lot of businesses that don't exist today that could exist should you have access to, to that kind of network. Yeah, I'm almost thinking like you could you could do anything from like imagine offer up except for instead of having yeah. to go like meet people in person, you just say, okay, I have this item and then you throw it in your box or whatever. It goes away from your home to the other person's home. You don't even know need to know where they live. Totally. Like as long as you do. And that transaction um, doesn't have to happen immediately. It can go in storage. Yeah. And then someone can say, I need this thing. And then you make that market work. Or it could be even something even more simple where it's like a laundry pickup where you mm -hmm. just like throw your shit in the, the yeah. bin and then it just like magically reappears as yeah. folded clothes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a lot of these businesses are great businesses, mm -hmm. but they're constrained because of the cost of return logistics and logistics in the front. I mean, that's like a $30 thing. So anything you're doing has to be worth more than $30 profit. So that's yeah. why grocery delivery and fast food delivery and, and these things that we're paying a premium on it happening quickly is worth it. Those are the only things that work in that instant logistic uh, market. Um, but the, you could like grocery shopping, a grocery list is kind of a crazy thing. It's like, if we tell our kids, they're gonna be like, oh, you need a grocery list. You like just waited till you had enough stuff on your list. And you're like, yeah, that, that's what we did. And they're like, okay, then you went to the warehouse, right? And picked it all off the shelf yourself. Like you're doing the pick and pack for a warehouse, and you're like, yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much, I guess. <laughs> like you were, you were doing the pick and pack. Um, but like, we'll be able to, you know. Um, I think as the market matures and, and people get used to it, then then now it makes sense to 
okay, like we're not going to sell spices in, in large containers. We'll sell it as needed, right? Because I like, here's this thing I'm making. I'm just going to get all the spices I need in the exact um, amounts. And enough of that market exists that someone automates that process and it gets handed off to a drone or whatever and then makes it to your house and you use that thing. I, I think there's just a lot of those things that we can't imagine today. And it, it, it's, you know, as we've kind of gone through the business, we've imagined a lot more of them. But early on, it was tough to imagine them except that this always happens in logistics and commerce from like the ancient times. It's like everyone like, underestimates how valuable making it more efficient, more speedy, better logistics more convenient. Is. Yeah. yeah. Like, what, what do you do with that? Like same thing with like the internet, you know, just like kind of like a tired example, but it's like, okay, internet speeds get faster. What are you gonna do with it? These static pages like don't even carry that much data. Well, now you're dynamic pages. Oh my gosh, like that changes everything, right? Like there's all these things that just a little bit of efficiency does add a lot when it comes to like kind of those um, base fundamental layer things. So like data speed, um, storage, uh, logistic speed, logistics ease, like all those things make a huge difference. Um, so that's where we felt good. Like we need to find something that really helps logistics today, helps it get to autonomous logistics as fast as possible, and then puts us in a great position to make hyper logistics, which is that up and down, happen as soon as autonomous logistics happens. So like, we wanna make it happen like right after. Um, so yeah, that, that was kind of a framework. Um, draft, thought drones initially, I like it, it, no slide on, like I have got to be the biggest drone fan and all what, the time. What, what, like I've heard you say that a few times. What does that mean? Did you like, have drones and build drones or what did you do? Yeah, I worked on a few drone projects. Okay. Um, either right at the end of college or right after we were working on, what do we call it? It's like really dumb name. The yellow drone project. I don't remember why. Oh, we wanted to make them yellow so people could see them in the sky. Oh, That's awesome. what it was. Great. So um, we were using uh, what the, oh, the Python computer vision package, OpenCV. Okay. Uh, great. Um, this is a while ago, but we were, we were using uh, quadcopters and we just have them like dock on these little pads that the goal was to put them on roofs so that you always had a photography drone mm. close enough that like you could dynamically call it. So like a roofing company could just had an API and be like, I want pictures of this. And there was enough uh, of the, like, our, our thought was like roof space, it has everything you need. It's like really safe place to land. Um, it's rated for the weight that you would need because like the AC units are, are placed there and they have power hookups right by because you have the AC units. So it's like- Could you almost like pay people with homes to like just slap one of your things on the roof? And I don't think you would even need, businesses are perfect, oh, right? Because okay. you have that back alley yeah. space behind so you really safe place to land. Um, so it's kind of like drone in the box now, like you have drone in the box, um, but for photography drones. So our, our thought was like, we don't even need to do the drone layer. Um, you just need to have those boxes available in enough places and high enough density. Um, that was like one of those fun projects that we, um, oh, that turned into a really fun project. Another one that I think is a great business today. Uh, oh, that business is so good. What was it called? Okay, but anyways, um, I thought it was just like that drone in the box solution that was open to anyone. Uh, there'd be enough dev support over time that people would uh, work with whatever that charging standard was. Um, that we could have enough play. And like, that is a really good business to like have, cause like there's a really great sci-fi book about autonomous drones and like that you, someone built this algorithm for autonomous drones where mm. they worked for energy. So it created this efficient market of like a drone to survive had to build up enough credits to get the energy it need and to like maintenance itself. And uh -huh. if it didn't, it just died. It was like, it's a great book. What is it called? I forget is what it it's like called. An, is it like an AGI drone book? Yeah, something like that. Okay. Um, it's like, yeah, they, 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 they're, they're just like, you make them and you release them and it's an efficient market. Huh. I mean, it's not great, but it's interesting. Um, it, was, it, was, it was kind of the thought. And, and then that turned into like that work with the open CV. Like we did it. We had like, you could call a drone and it come. It's like super easy to do though. It's not like hard. And that, that was kind of like, it is like drones are pretty easy. Um, what do you mean like, by that? Yeah, that is, someone's going to clip that and it's going to go. <laughs> it's not true. Drones are... An accelerometer 
four rotors, a package, and a promise of safety, mm. and a regulatory market that accepts them. So if you have the regulatory, then if you have those other things and you can prove high reliability and safety, you did it. That's it. Everything else is kind and of secondary. That's what Zipline has right now, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah. Um, a lot of people have that. And, you know, uh, A to Z drone, wing, mana. Um, who's doing the mushroom huts? Matterport. Um, there's a ton. And they're just, you know, waiting for the regulatory market to open up. That was kind of like our thought is like, okay, that's a pretty, that's a, that's a good space. But other people are doing it. Like, what do drones need to fully scale everywhere? You know, what's going to be that? And that's kind of like when we started asking that question and talking to people, that's when we realized like interacting with the building uh, really efficiently um, with something that you can retrofit and, and make it to different points of the building and, and up to delivery. And, yeah, uh, and, then, and then solving the, the longer high volume distances um, uh, is, what, is what we saw, mm-hmm. the, the missing piece being. Um, so that's what we went out to build and like what, what was needed for that um, is what ultimately led to Pipe Dream. Yeah, what, what did you decide? So you, one thing I love about you is that you talk with so many people. Um, mm. How many, when you were thinking about Pipe Dream, how many like city government officials and people like that did you talk with before mm. to like learn the problem and learn what regulatory yeah. wise would be working? Sit, you know, city government people, I found not to be the best people to talk to. Who's, who are the right people to talk to? Because it's really tough to find the person in charge in city yeah, government. And like, like, even in maker. city government, it's like tough to find that person. And that person's usually like super busy and like not a lot to talk to. And not many other people know exactly what it takes to work with that person. Um, you usually have like the same answer, which is fine. Like I, that is the right answer. And that's what I would give with them. But I found it better to talk to utility people, people who oh. work with the cities and know like, okay, I've this is like the relationships. Right, totally. This is what it takes. Those people were way super, 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 super helpful. So um, what were the most interesting conversations that you had and like learnings from the conversations that you had with utility company people? Okay, yeah. Things so for, the for most interesting people, conversation yeah. that kind of sums it all up is I talked to the mayor of Redacted City. Okay. Top 50 city. Nice. You knew where I was. Yeah. Probably easy to guess. Um, great mayor. Great mayor. Uh, anyways, so I made it up to him. And I like laid out the whole plan. I was like, what do you think? And he's like, I mean, if you have the money to do it, we're going to let you do it. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. This is like something that really helps like citizens and like here's the process for permitting. And, you know, a system exists for us to take a percentage. And I heard that from a lot of people that like there's this franchise fee system that exists for utilities where the cities and uh, gets a certain percentage of top line revenue when you use their easement. So then they kind of exist as a private market um, where with some stipulations, like they let you into those easements and you pay them a certain amount of revenue. And in one redacted city, it makes up 30% of their overall budget. So they are really incentivized to find either a way to grow the amount of utilities or grow the scale of the utilities that are already mm-hmm. in or add a new utility to add to that budget. Um, and so we, we found that a lot with cities is that like that type of utility permitting is way easier than any other type of permitting. So in our first uh, network, we got it in two weeks. We got the full permit to do um, you know almost mile long uh, city install through public right away under roads, uh, the whole thing. Um, and you know they, they have really good systems where you know if you're stopping traffic that adds complication but there's enough methods um, to tunnel that you don't need to stop traffic. And we never had to stop traffic. Um, there's a couple of times we like slowed down traffic to a certain parking lot, um, but it was never serious. Um, and I think it like, what we found is like, there's a lot of stigma with underground utilities, but then when you actually get into it, um, it's way easier than people think. And it, our, our thought is, Two things. One, it's very difficult to understand something that happens where you can't see and you overcomplicate the difficulty of it. Um, and then two is uh, it's a bit of like a you only see things when it affects your life. The like yeah. what's the there's a is it the dancing bear phenomenon where like yeah you talked about this too. I I've, anyway I don't know what it was but yes you talked about this I phenomena. love it <laughs> yeah 
Um, where if like someone's doing something interesting, then you can put like a bear on a unicycle in the background and no one will see it. Yeah. Um, so same thing with like, once you know what the machines look like that do this work, you realize they're all over the place. They're all over a city. Um, mm. But because they don't have to stop traffic anymore and interrupt your process, you're like, well, we must just not do any of that anymore. Um, but the, the answer is like, we just, you know, Ditch Witch and other companies have made it so easy to put in an underground utility. You don't have to mess with traffic. Um, once you like, if you ever look up um, what a horizontal directional drill is, mm -hmm. you realize they're everywhere. Um, there was one like over, like we're over here on the corner a few weeks ago. Uh, but yeah, so it's like, it's gotten a lot easier to put down in underground utilities in. Yeah. Uh, what, so I imagine that you like study the history of, you seem like someone who would study the history of an industry before they entered it. Um, what's the most interesting story that you learned about uh, through studying the history of like the underground, underground delivery mm. or like, you know, sewage, water, whatever yeah. business? Um, there is a really good story. Uh, we have never looked, some of it has to be folklore. That's fine. And some of it, it's true. Um, but the Postmaster General in 18, I want to say 60, but it, I'm so bad at remembering numbers. I think it's 1860, in the 1800s, uh -huh. um, was running an experiment in New York where they're putting underground pneumatic systems in for uh, postal, for, for uh, sending information back and forth. And you can find these pictures, but there's like these really interesting pictures of like what looks like a switchboard. But it's a whole bunch of pneumatic tubes and one person who's just like grabbing over here and putting over, and grabbing over, and grabbing. And they built out tens of miles in New York. I think it was like 20 something miles of these pneumatic tubes in New York. And it was going really well. And uh, the Postmaster General was like, we are going to do this everywhere. This is like such a great system. Um, there, there, there were problems with it, right? Like, I don't think pneumatic tubes are very good at all. Can you explain what a pneumatic tube is? Yeah, so uh, basically it's like a PVC pipe. Mm -hmm. And you imagine you put like a vacuum on one end and you put like a ball on the other end. Well, if that ball takes up the whole space of the PCC tube, you've created this vacuum suction effect and that thing's just gonna go vroom it's over what the, into the- uh, It's what the banks use, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really good way to, um, it's like a really clever way of transferring power really long way through a system um, from, a, from a single endpoint. Mm -hmm. um, really elegant. Problem is, is you have to retain that pressure across the whole network or it doesn't work. Um, even like a small gap. Screws everything up. Screws everything up. And you have to dig to fix it because the, the power lies in the infrastructure, which means like your reliability, you count on that infrastructure working for a really long time for it to work. So that was part of the problem. And the other part, which is like gets into the folklore is uh, so the Postmaster General is like, we gotta do this. And he uh, lost to the horse and buggy lobbyists, and which he felt like wasn't fair and wasn't based on numbers. And he felt like it was just like big horse big trying horse. to find <laughs> ways to use more horses. Um, and he resigned because he oh. disagreed with it. Again, could be folklore. And died shortly later on. That actually would not be surprising. Yeah. Like a lot of people who... Like they're super like even if they're married and then their spouse dies, they die yeah. right after their spouse yeah. died. He was that kind of guy. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyways, yeah, he's uh, we do it for him. <laughs> Not really. We found out that yeah, um, we had started the company before we found out that story, but um, Chicago had a lot of tunnels and they flooded. Really? Yeah. What happened with so, that? So um. I think that was about it. They had a huge tunnel system, and uh, one, one of the seals or one of them broke, and it flooded the whole system. There were other fail safes, and so if I remember right, yeah, just the whole thing flooded. Um, they never rebuilt it, or they rebuilt some of it, but I think a lot of it's still there. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's do. Let's do. This is the final question. Uh, what is the hardest thing you've overcome? I think I've had it overcome a lot. I was just talking to my wife about this. I think like one of my, I think you gotta have this as like an entrepreneur. It's like short term memory on difficulty. Uh, I, th th I'm gonna say this, but I, I would like to verify if it was true before it like goes on record. Um, but if I remember right, like when uh, a woman has a baby 
um, they do not retain the memory of how painful it was. And I've asked my wife yeah. this a million times. Uh, and I think like maybe asking her this has helped her remember because um, she still very much remembers. Um, but the, the, the pain, the, the, you do not retain the memory of the pain of it and it helps you do it again. Um, I think that's like, I have a lot of that in, in building stuff. It's like, I can go through, and I think a lot of people here too, like there's something I really love about the team is we can go through the hardest thing ever on a Friday and it can hurt and it can be like the most wind against you. Demoralizing. Demoralizing. Thing. Like, did we just waste six months of our lives? Come back on Monday, Ray Rock. Um, just like, I always tell the team, like everything in business is a sinusoidal wave. And what you can't see is that sinusoidal wave is doing this. It's going up, right? But all you feel is these ups and downs. And so when we're at down, the only thing you know for absolute certain is that things are going to go up. Hmm. And so like, hold on to that. Same thing. When you're in an up, the only thing you know is that it's going to suck soon. It's going to suck so bad soon. And so like, get off your high horse. There's not the time to celebrate. Like it's time to like batten down the hatches a little bit and like ride this wave while I say, like enjoy it, but don't, don't take pride in it. Um, I think this is something I found a lot too, is like you have to mute the spikes. Um, the more, like anything you feel in the positive, you'll feel the equal reaction in the negative. So like, this is exactly what Jeff Bezos talked about, where like if you get super excited about the stock price going up, then yeah. you're going to have to feel super down. Oh, I've the never stock heard that. Go down. I'm sure. Wait, you I'm haven't sure, heard this. I'm sure I have. I'm sure I have because it sounds like a Jeff Bezos <laughs> yeah, thing. No, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure that's where I got it from. But um, yeah, you have to like the, the more if things are good because sometimes things in startups can feel so good. And you're like, this is so easy. Yeah, Mark Andreessen talks about it. Like it's either euphoria or like the worst painful thing in the world. Totally, and there's nothing in between. I, I don't think you can ever feel that euphoria. And especially don't think it's like because of you. Maybe it is. Maybe you have done it. But if you feel like all that momentum up is from you, then you will also feel like all that momentum down is from you too. And I think there's, there's so many times that like startups do this. And sometimes like startups can put you on a pedestal you've never been on before. Where like people will be like, like we went through this where like for so long people called us like idiots. And they were wrong. And then we went through a phase where people were like, y'all are geniuses. They were also wrong, again, right? Like the, yeah. <laughs> the answer lies somewhere in the middle. Um, we're like maybe a little smart and a little lucky and you know, we are not geniuses, I promise you that. Um, but like you can't take that praise or you will feel the people calling you idiots just as much as you feel that praise, right? You kind of gotta like keep everything in like the middle, like you can't, it, like, I, I think there's the only way to have staying power. Um, Cause then you like, as soon as you get on that pedestal and you're at the peak, then anyone getting close to you, you're, you're comparing yourself to them and being like, oh my gosh, I'm like, oh, I lost that thing. It's like, are there competitors who are gonna beat me? Or are they gonna take the spotlight? Like, are there people who think they're smart? Like, and I mean, Jeff Bezos has a great point. Like you, none of that matters. Everything external, it's like, can you accomplish your goal and serve your customers in the right way? And like, that's what we focus on. Um, and then like, especially in hardware, there comes times where like, you have to like completely change. You, you find out information you didn't know. You've got to change years of work on a dime and you got to look like an idiot for a while. And if you are like, have built in this can happen, I've seen this happen to people who I thought were like such clear, humble thinkers and they get like, dude, that you can't get a hint of an ego in startups or it will absolutely destroy you. Um, cause it's like, it's great on the way up. Uh, and then some people, and that's a success bias, like Travis Kalanick just kept riding it up, kept riding it up and you can play that game. Um, but in most startup situations, you have a peak in a valley, a peak in a valley, and you've got to like be able to retain your self-confidence in the valley. And it has to come just like directly from yourself, it, it, not external validation. So it's, I think a lot of that. So the hardest thing has been, was, was probably in reality, that early fundraising phase, it was really, really long talked to 100 to 200 people who all said no. Um, I'd what have to get that biggest, right. What were their biggest complaints? Uh, it was like, by mo uh, one was like, <laughs> we have a good amount of emails that were like, love this idea, but like, it's either not possible or y'all aren't the ones who are gonna do it. We were in a shed in Oklahoma, it's like a fair point. Um, like, you'll never do this once was a lot of it. Like, it's just like, I don't see this ever being possible. If blank can't do it, you can't do it. And then people would offer us like other things. Like, maybe you could do this in software. Or like, maybe you should try something else, but don't do this. 
Um, so we went through like a lot of it, but like what got us through that was um, when we started the fundraising process, we felt like it was going to be like really, really hard. And so we said, okay, the goal here is 250 no's. So like the only metric we're going to look at is how do we get to 250 no's the fastest? Uh, and when we get to 250 no's, we have blind faith that through law of big numbers, we will have gotten one yes. And if we don't, something is very wrong, but we, we reset, we'll rethink it, and come back and do another 250 no's. Um, I don't think we didn't get to 200, I don't think. I think we got to 100 something before we got a yes, and then everything snowballed from there. Um, but we did go through a lot. So it's like every time we get a no, it's like, yeah, it's part of the process. It's like on, onwards and upwards to 250. We'll That's get wild. that yes eventually. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting when you talk about like you're in a shed in Oklahoma and people, as you just said, are like, this can't possibly be what you know, future greatness looks like, right? And uh, in fact, it is. Like, it's, it's very strange because while I'm like traveling and, and visiting these folks, um, my brain is saying, this is definitely not the next Apple. And then I'm like, no, it is. It is, in fact, yeah. that. Yeah. You know? So you have to like counteract your brain, <laughs> your bias, right? Yeah. Of like, no, this can't possibly be what a great company yeah. you're making looks like. But you do have to. And I think this is something we struggled with. And, and I struggled with another things, right? Whereas like, I wanted to fight the bias. Uh, but you have to, you, you, you have to just realize you're not always going to beat the bias. And so we, that shed in Oklahoma, um, we call it the zoom wall. We had a zoom wall, uh, and it was like, where are computers faced? And we made that look so nice. Um, we spent some money like to make it, we made uh -huh. like a few hundred dollars uh, at Home Depot. We got like wood panels, put up wood panels. I got some poster board and I cut out the pipe dream logo and like, it like sat off the wall. So it looked like metal. When Zoom compressed it, it looked like metal. People thought it was like, oh, so not, people would uh, like pop open the Zoom. They'd be like, oh, y'all are farther along than we thought you were. And it was just <laughs> the Zoom wall. And I'd always like, I, oh, like, I couldn't help but like, I, I hated the, the pageantry of it. So a lot of the times I'd show people that were still in the shed, but they're just like the wall. But it was like, it fixed that bias like uh, on the onset. Um, we had an infinity mirror that we made. Um, so it was like really cheap, like, but, but it made a huge difference in how people perceived um, progress. And it just, it sucks that that's true. But um, so many, I feel like so many really smart engineers, instead of like trying to find ways to work with the bias, they try to fight like, well, that shouldn't be how it, it is. It shouldn't be how it is. So I'm just going to assume or pretend that it isn't. Yeah. 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 I'm going to be so good on, on I, I, I can't be ignored. But that's just not also how it works. Like, you, you, you got to do things. You got you to gotta do things to make the sign on the hammer look like the hammer is going to work, right? Like, oh, that's a good sign. Like, probably a good hammer. And that's, like, that's how we choose products. It's like that thing looks packaged like a good product would be packaged, ergo, probably a good packet or good product. Have you thought about it all? Like, I know that you guys released, I think, one or two videos of your system actually mm -hmm. in motion. Yeah. And I kind of feel like a big reason why SpaceX and Tesla mm -hmm. have so many applications is because mm -hmm. the hype videos mm -hmm. where like people get excited yeah. about those companies. Have you thought about creating more content around mm -hmm. what you're actually building and how it works? Yes. Uh, to kind of we need to people. Um, hundred percent. I think that's where like my shortcomings, um, like we are all the same here that like, we are so overly careful about releasing something in a way that it looks different than what it really is. Mm. Um, even to like, just like framing things a certain way. Like we really just want to show exactly what it is, you know? Um, and I think we just put too much pressure on ourselves and then it's like too hard. So, uh, well, the other thing we need too to is more. like with, you know, Elon, he, he puts out when, when I saw that person come out in a spandex suit, Three years ago, <laughs> I, I just started. I was, I was like laughing and cringing at the same time and thinking to myself, how could you, like, in my mind, I was like, I would never do this. And turns out two or three years later, he's got a bot. It yeah. works. It's yeah. not what he was initially, you know. Yeah. It's not what it initially looked like, <laughs> but it works well. Yeah. And it's really cool. No, we're, we're going to do, um, yeah, we'll we'll do a we'll do a hype video soon. We got we got like most of the footage for it. Um, it should be on like a few weeks. Okay, honestly, so it might be out. I don't know when this is going on out, but it might be out soon. Tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's going out tomorrow. Yeah, it won't be out. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. <laughs> okay, it's close. Yeah, yeah. And we also like we try to stay. Um, we call it. I call it. I don't think I'm else called it this. Iceberg stealth. 
Iceberg? Iceberg? Yeah, so you have like, it's like a middle ground between stealth and not stealth. Mm. So um, like part, you, you only see like 20% of the iceberg. So that, that's kind of like oh. where we start is like, we want people to underestimate us a little bit. Um, I don't know how much of that is good strategy and how much of it is cope. Um, Mark Zuckerberg like, loves to be underestimated. Yeah, go, about go, Google times. did the same thing. Yeah. They always underestimated by like 20% the amount of searches they're doing. So anytime anyone, or the amount of websites they've indexed. So anytime anyone tried to beat them. So uh, Bing tried to beat them on websites index and they spent all this time, like we're gonna index more than it says on Google's uh -huh. homepage. And so they put all this time, they're like, yeah, we beat them by like 2 million or something. And then Google's like, change the number. Because <laughs> they've indexed more. Oh they just didn't, they weren't publicizing it. Um, and, and, and like hardware too, it's like a lot of these like hype things are fleeting. Um, so if you look to like our, our theory is if you hype yourself up too much, then it's just like it, it gets old, you know? It's like be really, you need to be really sure when you're going to say this is, we're going to hype this up because it's going to be something that has staying power. Um, it's you true. Make of like, sure that you're like under promising. Totally. This was amazing. Garrett, thank you, thank so, you much. so much for having yeah, me on. This is great. Coming on, yeah. Thank you so much.